Hi guys. <laughs> I appreciate you having me. Uh, I hope you guys had a good weekend. It was definitely a busy one for the Trump administration. On Friday, uh, the president signed several proclamations ahead of the start of the new month. Uh, those are all available at whitehouse.gov. On Saturday, uh, you may have not noticed, but it was the president's 100th day in office, for those of you not keeping count. Uh, the president took several significant steps towards leveling the playing field for American workers and businesses while visiting an Ames factory in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Ames has been making tools in America since before our country's founding. It's an example of the amazing persistence of the American spirit, the type of company that will be able to expand and create new jobs under the president's pro-growth economic agenda. He signed two executive orders at Ames that will help keep jobs and wealth in our country. The first fulfilled an executive order of a major campaign promise by directing the Secretary of Commerce to identify every violation and abuse of our trade agreements and to use every measure available under the law to end those abuses. And the second established the Office of Trade Manufacturing Policy, which will be led by Dr. Peter Navarro. This office replaces the National Trade Council and elevates it to a permanent office within the White House, sending an important signal to the world that the United States will no longer tolerate trade cheating while our manufacturing and defense industrial base suffers. He also signed a third executive order over the weekend mm -hmm. establishing the American Technology Council, which will be led by Chris Liddell, which is dedicated to modernizing the federal government's information technology so that it works more efficiently and effectively for everyone. And he wrapped up the day speaking to thousands at a rally in Pennsylvania. Uh, this weekend, the president also engaged with some of our longtime allies in Southeast Asia who are on the front lines against the fight against ISIS and other forms of terror through calls mm -hmm. with the president of the Philippines, the prime minister mm -hmm. of Singapore, and the prime minister of Thailand. Today's the another, a start of another big week here. After signing a proclamation on Law Day, he stopped by the Kennedy Garden, where around 100 members of the Independent Community Bankers of America kicked off their capital summit. Smaller banks are one of the driving forces behind economic uh, investment and development in our communities, but they've been disproportionately harmed by the dramatic increase in regulation since 2008, declining in number by 30 percent since 2008. The President's pro-growth agenda, including instituting what he's called a 21st century Glass-Steagall, will allow these banks to spend less time complying with unnecessary requirements, many of which were designed to police much larger entities, and more time infusing their communities and local small businesses with capital. It's also the start of Small Business Week. Today, Ivanka Trump will be participating in a conversation at the United States Institute of Peace with SBA Administrator Linda McMahon and the Vice President will deliver remarks to the National Small Business Week Awards Program later this afternoon. Uh, back to the President's schedule. Uh, after speaking with the Community Bankers members, the President had lunch with Vice President Pence, Secretary of State Tillerson, and Secretary of Defense Mattis, as, as well as uh, National Security Advisor McMaster, before meeting separately with Secretary Tillerson. I also want to mention this morning that FEMA held a severe weather coordination call to discuss impacts on the remaining threat for continued severe weather across portions of the southwest to the Mississippi Valley, which has already killed five people in Texas. Secretary of Homeland Security Kelly participated on the call, and the White House is in contact with local governments in these affected areas. We'll have uh, those communities in our thoughts and prayers and encourage everyone to follow the directions of their state, tribal, and local officials to stay safe. Finally, let me run down what we're expecting for the President's schedule this week. Tomorrow, he'll present the Commander-in-Chief Trophy to the United States Air Force Academy. Wednesday, the President will host the President of the Palestinian Authority for an official visit. And on Thursday, he'll host a National Day of Prayer event. And as I mentioned last week, he will then attend an event commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Coral Sea aboard the USS Intrepid and meet with the Prime Minister of Australia. I'll continue to update you on the schedule throughout the week. And with that, your questions. Jill. Thank you very much. Um, so I wanted to go back to the comments that the President made uh, this weekend on Face the Nation um, on health care regarding pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. And he has said specifically that the bill he wants to sign would, quote, mandate that pre-existing conditions be covered. Can you talk us through a little bit of what he meant there? Um, was he referring to something he wants to push to include in the bill? Was he talking about the language that's already in there? Well, I think both, um, in the sense of the MacArthur Meadows amendment ensures that pre-existing uh, 
existing conditions are continue to be covered. Uh, then obviously as this bill hopefully passes the House this week or whatever it does, uh, and then goes through the Senate and the House, this is a, an issue that is important to him. How does he ensure, though, that, that those people actually are treated affordably? I mean, there was an estimate from AARP that if you were looking just at the high-risk pools, the premiums could be as high as over $25,000 for somebody. What, what is he doing to ensure that that, that that doesn't happen? So there's two things, uh, and I think he mentioned in the same interview, that just to be clear, um, right now, under Obamacare, uh, as it collapses on its own weight, people who have pre-existing conditions are really the most vulnerable. Because if you have an insurance system that no longer is able to provide care to those who need it, um, then I think we've, we've talked about this before, you have a card without coverage. So what the President is doing is ensuring going forward as we attempt to repeal it and replace it, that pre -exist coverage of pre-existing co uh, conditions is at the core of that. Uh, so that is something that he has ensured uh, is in the current bill and will continue to push for to make sure that coming out of the Senate and going to conference is there as well. John. Uh, a couple things for you, Sean, if I could. First of all, what do you say to conservatives who feel like they didn't get a whole lot out of this spending bill? There was no money for the wall, no cuts to sanctuary cities, funding for Planned Parenthood was maintained. What do you say to those conservatives? I'll take them in order. Uh, but I think the President got a lot out of this bill, more specifically. Um, $21 billion for the, to help rebuild the military. I think that is something that uh, he was very proud to campaign on um, and, and is delivering on. That's, that's probably the biggest thing. With respect to border security, he got $1.52 billion into the current uh, language that's posted. I think that's a significant. And remember, I think people have to keep in context. We're talking about 2017 funding, right? So this is something that most presidents would walk into office and that would have been done. Um, because the last Congress didn't do this under President Obama, we have an opportunity to get some of the President's priorities uh, infused for the last five months of 2017. That's a big step forward um, and something that he'll continue to fight for in 2018. Uh, when the fiscal year starts the end of September, um, we will have an opportunity to really infuse the President's priorities. But I think there's a lot there. And there's also uh, D.C. school choice was something that, that we felt very strongly about making sure it was back in. Um, there's no Obamacare bailout. There's uh, the coal miners is something that the President felt very strong on, on um, making sure they got taken care of. That, that happened. Uh, so there's a lot in this bill um, that I think of, of the priorities that he put forward on. But clearly you had to give up on some things. No, I mean, I think on the Planned Parenthood thing in particular, um, you know, the, but, but again, remember, this is 2017 funding. This is something that he wouldn't normally even have had a shot at because it should have been done. So infusing his priorities in the 2017 budget cycle is actually something that he's been able to, to have a, a say in, which is a big deal for the, the remaining five months. The 2018 budget will, will address those things. But this is a down payment on border security. It's a down payment on his ability uh, to rebuild the military. And repealing and replacing Obamacare will address a lot of the other health care issues. And the, the other issue I had, on the uh, pending visit of uh, Duterte from the Philippines, uh, Chris Kuhn said that the President is giving his stamp of approval to human rights abuses. Uh, Governor John Sununu, on the other hand, said this is part of the unpleasant things that Presidents have to do. What's the White House's perspective on Duterte and him coming in? Well, I think um, it is uh, an opportunity for us to work with countries in that region that can help play a role in diplomatically and economically isolating North Korea. And frankly, the national interest of the United States, the safety of our people and the safety of people in the region are the number one priorities of the President. Mike. I wanted to ask you about the tax deductions. The White House has talked a little bit about that as a way to uh, curb uh, big tax breaks for the rich. Uh, are you looking at any other policy changes uh, when it comes to uh, 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 limiting breaks for the top 1 percent? Well, I, I, we're at the beginning of this process, but I think you saw from the briefing that, that was given the other day, the focus on this is really at lower and middle income Americans. Um, the doubling of the standard deduction means that a family of of, uh, of four that is making, you know, right now they're getting a $24,000 deduction, uh, which means in a lot of cases you're going to see a family pay zero taxes at the lower end of the economic scale. That's a big deal for them to really help put more money back in their pocket and help them take care of their family. Try. On, on health care, there seems to be a new optimism from the White House. How confident is the President that he will get a health care bill passed the House this week? Um, I think the President has made it clear that he's not instituting a timeline. Um, I've said this before and I'll continue to say that we feel confident the direction this is going. Um, we see more and more 
members come on board. Um, a lot of the changes were made make the bill not only better, but garner greater support. So uh, we feel very good about it. On, on North Korea, uh, today the president told Bloomberg he was open to meeting with Kim Jong-un. Uh, if the conditions were right, how does the president uh, define the right condition to have this meeting? Well, there's a lot of things that go along with that, and I think that's the key thing. Under the, under the right circumstances was, I believe, the phrase he used. Um, and I think that is something in keeping with, with our poli uh, with, consistent with the policy expressed by Secretary Tillerson as well. Um, we, we've got to see their the provocative behavior wretched down immediately. That, those are, there's a lot of conditions that I think would have to happen with respect to its behavior um, and, its, and, and to show signs of good faith. Clearly, the conditions are not there right now, but I think the President's made it clear, as Secretary Tillerson had the other day, that uh, you know, if the conditions, if the circumstances are, uh, present themselves, uh, we would be prepared to, but they're clearly not at this time. Thanks, um, Picking up on health care, it's believed possibly that you might be down, uh, Republican staff maybe just a handful of votes away. Uh, here we are at 2 o'clock Monday afternoon. Is this the, the closest that you think you've gotten? I know you don't want to talk about timelines, but is this as, as close to maybe getting to that magic 216 number that you've talked about? Well, sure. If, I mean, we're not going to. Once we get 216, we'll stop counting, and uh, I think the speaker speaker gets that. But as I mentioned to Trey, I mean, we're getting closer and closer every day. So I would assume that today we were closer than we were a week ago. Um, but we're not there yet, uh, and that that decision is going to be wholly within uh, the speaker, the majority leader, and the whip to 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 let us know when they're going to open that vote up. And let me ask you about Dodd Frank. The president um, just gave an interview in which he said, uh, "I am looking at that right now." He goes on to say there's some people that want to go back to the old system, right, so we're going to look at that, meaning potentially breaking up the bank. So breaking up the banks, going back to Glass-Steagall, is that something that he is just looking at, or is that something that is a preference of his at this point? Well, I think I mentioned it in the opening. He's looking at a 21st century Glass-Steagall, uh, but it's something that we've talked about at the beginning. He mentioned this on the campaign trail. Um, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, but it is something that is, is currently being looked at. Sarah? Thanks, John. Uh, so you're saying that you, you're not confident that the votes are lined up behind the health care bill. So this morning when Gary Cohn said that the bill was ready to be brought to the floor, did Gary Cohn misspeak? No, I just, I would never want to get in front of the speaker. Um, that's that's up to them. I mean, we have a good whip count. I think we feel very good about where we are and where it's, where it's headed. Um, but ultimately, the speaker and the House leadership determine when to call a vote. Um, I think that we know that when the vote gets called, we'll feel confident that it's going to be able to pass. Zeke? Sean, uh, the president on the campaign trail raised uh, alarm about uh, federal debt and deficits. This spending bill that at the next that get us through the end of the fiscal year um, doesn't include any of the offsets really that the president requested in this year's budget. Is the president, you know, will the president sign this agreement that does increase the federal deficit? Uh, I think we got uh, a number of the president's priorities included in the CR. Um, when we are at the final point, the president will make a decision. But right now, he's pleased to see the plus up for the military. He's uh, pleased to see a down payment on border security. He's pleased about the D.C. Uh, opportunity scholarships. Um, there's a lot that he's pleased in. And I think, again, as I mentioned to John, um, we're, we're getting a shot at the 2017 funding, which should have been done last year. So I, you call for keeping that balance, essentially. Keeping I that understand flat. that. And I think that, uh, obviously, you know, this is something that required 60 votes in the Senate. We couldn't have our entire way on this, but there's, we're five months away from having a 2018 budget, and I think the President's priorities will be reflected um, much more in that. Annie. Um, President, you made comments um, when asked about Pledge of Freedom. You said the journalists are not except, exempt from assassination. Um, did the President know about those comments and about his record of human rights abuses when he extended the invitation for him to visit? I mean, the president gets fully briefed on the leaders that he's speaking to, obviously, but the number one concern of this president is to make sure that we do everything we can um, to protect our people and specifically to economically and diplomatically isolate uh, North Korea. And I think when you look at um, what he is doing in terms of building that coalition of countries in that region to do it, I think this is hopefully going to have – well, he knows yeah, – I mean, I'm not going to tell you every single thing that's in his brief, but he's well aware of when he, when he speaks with a leader, uh, he gets briefed on, on a lot about their, what they're doing, what they've done. Um, that's all part of, uh, of the brief. Mara. One question yeah, just right. about the future of Sebastian Gorka. Is uh -huh. he, can you tell us why he's leaving the White House? I, I have no, there's no personnel announcement at the time. Uh, I have no 
belief that he is currently leaving the White House. Uh, so there's nothing to update you on with respect to that, and we wouldn't comment on personnel matters uh, at this time. Thank Mara. You, John. I have a health care and an Israel question on health care. When the President talks about a guarantee for pre-existing conditions, current law says you have to, insurance companies have to sell to people with pre-existing conditions and they can't charge them more than someone else in that area. Is that the guarantee that the President wants? So the bill does not remove Obamacare's guaranteed issue requirement. Right. That's it. And, and on the community ratings, uh, the bill would allow states to waive Obamacare's community rating requirement if certain conditions designated to preserve access to coverage from people with pre-existing conditions are met. And there are uh, reduced average premiums, increased enrollment, stabilize the market, stabilize premiums for those with pre-existing. The bottom line is to try to give the states flexibility to actually get that premium down. Right. But people with pre-existing conditions would continue to get access, but not at the same price as other people. Well, the idea is actually they would create a high-risk pool. The idea is actually to create a system where it gets the premium down for them as well. Right. Under high-risk pools could still charge them much more. No, no, but you can't keep saying you're right. When I say the whole goal of this is to give the states the flexibility to get lower premiums, that's the goal all around, is to make sure that the system that we employ gets it down. John Gizzi. Oh, wait, my, oh, I'm sorry. Just you're sorry about that. Thank Problem. you, Sean. Um, the president turned to Bibi Netanyahu at that press conference and famously said settlements are not helpful. Israel is going to build 15,000 new homes in East Jerusalem. Does he think that um, Netanyahu is snubbing him? We're going to have a conversation. I'm sure that we'll continue to have conversations uh, with the prime minister. And uh, and so aware of that? I, I'm not going to. That will be something that the president will continue to discuss. John. Thank you. Oh, well, we'll do one, two Johns. All right. Uh, let me go first, John. Yes. All right. Sound good? Uh, it's quite a negotiation. <laughs> we, may need, we, we may need you. From the art of the deal. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I wanted to ask about some news the President uh, made this morning in an interview that he conducted with uh, Bloomberg. Uh, in that interview, he talked about the possibility of raising gas taxes to pay for infrastructure spending. And of course, the President has put forward the idea of a trillion dollar infrastructure spending plan. Can you talk a little bit more about this possibility of raising gas taxes? Yeah, so what the President said during that interview was is that folks from the industry had come to him and expressed to that, him how uh, the deteriorating roads were affecting their ability uh, to deliver goods and services throughout this country, uh, and that they had expressed a willingness uh, to see something like that as a way to help pay for and repair the, the roads and bridges, and that he said that he, out of respect, would definitely listen to them and consider it. That's as it relates to this idea that the gas tax in America hasn't been raised for some time. What makes the president believe that now is the time that Republicans who have been opposed to this idea would be open to this idea? I think you're missing the, the he he did not express support for it. He expressed that a group that had met with him expressed support with it and that he, out of respect, would consider their request. That's it. There was no endorsement of it or support for it. He was just relaying what another industry group had shared with him um, about how to pay for the roads and bridges that need to be repaired and the impact that deteriorating roads and bridges are having on their ability um, to operate and to deliver goods and services and, frankly, the cost that it is having on, on their trucks, on their infrastructure. John Gizzi. You have not foreclosed this possibility of racism. No, I think people ask the President all the time, please consider the following policy, and he has an open mind. I mean, there are people on both sides of the aisle, different backgrounds, that come in to see the President and ask him, could you please consider this, will you keep an open mind on it? And I think that's, frankly, what the President was doing. John Gizzi. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, John. Uh, <laughs> and thank you, John. I have two questions one foreign policy and one on domestic politics. First, last Wednesday, the Kremlin outlawed the Open Russia movement, the premier opposition group to the ruling regime in Russia, and the following day, security forces were forcibly closing down Open Russia's office in Moscow and other places. Uh, does the administration have a statement on this? I do not. I would refer you to the State Department. All right. My second question is, um, on Sunday, Congresswoman Ileana Ross Layton, uh, a 14-term veteran of the House, past chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, announced her retirement. Her statement comes on the heels of a similar announcement by Congressman Chaffetz, and before that, only a few weeks ago, 
Lynn Jenkins of Kansas. That's three respected Republican House members all calling it quits. Is the president concerned about the number of Republican House members who do not want to be on the ballot next time and are leaving Congress? No, and I, I respectfully, I would say that there, there are two groups of folks. I mean, in the case of Congresswoman Russ Layton, I think she's been here 35 years and she's 28. 28. Um, and, and so she's just decided that it's time um, to, to retire. In the case of Congressman Chaffetz, he announced that, you know, that, that doesn't, I don't think that there's um, any any belief that you have to stay here for, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, there's always going to be churn between election cycles, between members of both parties who decide for a number of reasons, um, you know, to go back home. And I think that's a healthy part that's uh, of the democracy, and that's frankly something that our framers saw it as citizen legislatures. So to some degree, that's a healthy part of it, uh, but we feel very confident about uh, where we stand. Jennifer. Sean, uh, the President opted not to ex uh, continue Obama's tradition of holding an Easter prayer breakfast, but he is holding a National Day of Prayer event. Was that a scheduling issue, or did he think, what was the thought process there? I, I don't, I think, I, I really don't know. I know that we wanted to, to do this National Prayer Breakfast um, this, this Sunday, and I think you're going to see a lot of folks represented. It's, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know enough about Obama saying how far back it went, but, uh, you know, the, each president's going to have their own traditions, and I think this is one um, that the president, um, you know, you that, that morning after you've got the Easter egg roll and there's a lot going on, um, this is his way of, of starting a tradition here at this White House to bring faith leaders from a variety of backgrounds here to the White House. Sean. Amy. Thanks, Sean. Uh, back to Glass Eagle for a second. As you sure. can imagine, the president's comments today are getting a lot of attention on Wall Street. So can we be just very clear about this? Does the president favor breaking up the big banks? I think he talked about it on the campaign trail, and he's mentioned it before, this idea of a 21st century Glass-Steagall, a modernization of it, um, and we're not at a point where we're ready to roll out details of that yet. This is something, as the president said in that interview, uh, he is actively looking at options and considering things. We're not, we're not at a position uh, to make any announcements on this at this time. Any steps toward that behind the scenes that we're not aware of? Well, I mean, of? he's obviously been briefed by his advisors. Secretary Mnuchin and others have given him ideas and thoughts to ponder. We have nothing to announce at this time. Todd. Thanks, John. Uh, so the lack of border wall funding raises a question of just how serious the president is about getting the border wall constructed. Is it not urgent? Is it not an emergency anymore to, uh, to build this barrier? What is the timetable and deadline that he has in mind? Well, make no mistake, the wall is going to be built. The president has made it very clear. Uh, we have five months left in this fiscal year. Um, we're getting $1.52 billion for border security. There's a lot that can be done with that. We've got a lot of things that happen before the wall is built in terms of planning, technology, gates. Um, there's a lot of things that can, that can do to prepare, uh, prepare for, for that wall being constructed. Uh, our big, this was a down payment on, for 2017, and as we get ready for fiscal year 2018 that will start in, um, in, in the beginning of October, this will be a major priority. It will be built. Is there a time certain? Is there a deadline by the end of 2018? Well, by I, that it will be completed? I know the president wants it done as quick as possible. There have been bids that have been put out. Uh, part of what the Homeland Security uh, Department is reviewing now are not just the cost, but the timetable for a lot of that. So as we move through the planning phase, that's definitely going to be part of the consideration. But obviously, the president wants it done uh, as soon as possible. Jonathan. Well, 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 Jonathan. Uh, coming back to, uh, to North Korea, the president didn't just say that he would be open to meeting with Kim Jong Un under the right circumstances. He said he would be honored to meet with him. This is somebody who has starved his own people, somebody that has threatened to destroy the United States. Just last week he put out a video showing the capital getting destroyed by North Korean fighters. How could he be honored to meet with Kim Jong-un? Well, the president understands uh, the threat that North Korea poses, and he will do whatever is necessary under the right circumstances to protect our country from the threat that they pose. Um, How so, that be an honor? Well, I mean, John, I, mean, I, I guess because he is still a head of state, um, so it's, it, it is sort of a, there's a diplomatic piece to this, but the bottom line is the president's going to do what he has to do right now. He's building a coalition in the region to isolate North Korea, both economically and diplomatically, to get the threat, uh, to, to take that threat down. Um, and, and so I, 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 but that is his number one priority right now, is protecting this country and our people. What do you mean when you call him uh, one smart cookie or a pretty smart cookie? Well, I think his point was he, he went over this in the interview that the, he assumed power at a, at a young age. 
uh, when his father passed away, and there was a lot of potential threats that could have come his way, and he's obviously uh, managed to uh, to lead a country forward uh, despite the obvious concerns that we and so many other people have. Um, the pre you know he is a young person to be leading a country with nuclear weapons, um, and so. That set aside, I think the President recognizes the threat that he posed and is doing everything he can to isolate that threat and to make sure that we bring stability to the region. Does Margaret. Margaret. Deal with the Margaret. Uh, Margaret. Sean, on North Korea and then on the Philippines, on North Korea, uh, both with the President's comment on Kim Jong-un and what Secretary Tillerson said, you seem to be making the offer that we could have direct talks with North Korea. Who's going to be doing no, no, those? Please. Yeah, I, I just, I, again, I think, I think that you, you've the, the key part of the President's statement was under the right circumstances. And that is the key. And those circumstances do not exist now. This is consistent with what Secretary Tillerson said the other day. Um, but I think that until, if, if North Korea continues down a degree of provocative behavior, then those circumstances will never be there. Uh, but we want to hold out the possibility that if North Korea were ever serious about completely dismantling its nuclear capability and taking away the threat that they pose both to the region and to us, that there's always going to be a possibility uh, of that occurring. That possibility is not there at this time. Who would lead that? Is that well, the, we're not. We're, we're so far away from that possibility existing. To start identifying an individual would be highly premature. When you have been asked about uh, President Duterte and his human rights record, you continue to say the effort here is to isolate the Philippines from North Korea. Part of this coalition to, well, to isolate also North Korea. build a coalition. Yeah. Are you suggesting that the Philippines has some sort of inappropriate contact with North Korea? Are you suggesting that we are requesting greater access, perhaps, to their military bases? What is it exactly? Well, I think there's there's an economic country? piece to this as well, um, and I'm not going to go into. That's part of the reason that I think the president wants to meet with him, um, and I'm not going to get ahead of their discussions. But I would suggest to you that there are multifaceted ways and areas in which not just the Philippines but other countries in the region can help play a role, both economically, diplomatically, and otherwise, to help deter the threat that they pose. Are you uh, suggesting, though, that they are Berkeley. trading or conducting some kind of No, I'm not going to, like I said, you I, say economic peace, that's what I just want to clarify. Right, and, and again, I'm just going to let the, the President, will have an opportunity to speak with him uh, about those objectives. Uh, at this time, I'm not going to get ahead of that discussion. Sean, Glenn. Uh, Sean, 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 two, Sean, two quick related questions. First of all, you just described Kim Jong-un as somebody who led <laughs> his country uh, forward at an early age. The President has invited Duterte, who, as Annie pointed out, has talked about assassinating journalists. The President put out a statement after Erdogan uh, won his referendum, congratulating him. He said kind things about Putin during the campaign, said kind things about Saddam Hussein. Does the President have a thing with these totalitarian leaders? Does he admire something about the way these guys conduct themselves? No, the President it clearly, as I've said, understands the threat that North Korea poses. Um, so having someone with the potential nuclear capability to strike um, another country, and potentially our country at some point in the future, is something the President takes very seriously. And so the idea that he is doing everything diplomatically, economically, and militarily to consider every way to prevent that threat um, from uh, taking on the United States is something. I, I understand. That. Unfortunately, those are the neighbors. <laughs> there are certain things. Those are the countries in the region. Those are the countries that can be helpful. Uh, as we move forward to try to prevent uh, the threat that they that they pose. Go ahead. Yes. Follow up, one follow-up question on on uh, Sunday, uh, Chief of Staff Priebus, talking to this gentleman right here, said, with respect to the libel laws and the First Amendment, quote, <coughs> talking about uh, news outlets that printed false articles, quote, I think uh, it's something that we've looked at. How that gets executed or whether that goes anywhere is a different story. Is that a project that is currently being worked on by the Council's office? Can you just tell me the status of that? Who is pursuing that? Well, I think the, the Chief of Staff made it very clear that uh, that is something that is being looked into substantively and then both logistically how it would happen. But that's nothing new. It's something the President talked about on the campaign trail. Is, is the Council actually I'm not, investigating I, I, I will not go into it, but I just tell you that it's been Sean, two, questions, two, two questions. One on, um, just to clarify on North Korea, were those conditions that you laid out um, early to the earlier question, would, are those the conditions that would have to be met before there was any meeting, i.e., that North Korea would have to agree to totally uh, disarm its nuclear program, stop threatening their neighbors? Are those the conditions? I think those are some of the conditions. There's going to be a whole host of ones uh, that we determine 
uh, that the State Department determines in consultation with the President that have to be met. As I mentioned, we are so early into this process uh, that I don't see this happening anytime soon. But I think that, as the President, like I said, under the right circumstances, those circumstances aren't present today, uh, and there would have to be significant change for that to even be a possibility. Okay, question on, a, on a separate subject, uh, the chief executives of United Airlines will be on the Hill tomorrow. Is the president at all, uh, does the president think that Congress should pass any laws after the incident last month where the passenger was dragged off? Uh, should there be some, uh, should there be more done to protect passengers on airplanes from those, from those type of incidents? Uh, I, I think there's two things. One is I think the industries probably need to, you know, and have said that they've taken a look at how they're handling a number of issues within that, um, both in terms of compensation, how they're handling uh, passengers who are on planes. So there's an industry component, and then I'll leave it up to Congress to decide whether or not it's appropriate um, to address it legislatively. Once there was a, a piece of legislation, then we could, you know, we would have an opportunity to weigh in that. Cecilia. So I would ask you to clarify something else the President said. Um, he said, I don't stand by anything. How is the American public supposed to digest that, supposed to trust what the President says when he himself says of his own comments, I don't stand by anything? What are you referring to? It's in the CBS interview with John Dickerson in the Oval Office. I, I'm, I'm just, I need the more context. It was about wiretapping. He was asked to, uh, if he still believes President Obama is a bad or evil guy, do you still stand by those comments? And the President said, I don't stand by anything. No, he, that was a long back and forth exchange, and that's why I'm asking for the context. But I think the point is he made, he clearly stands by that. That's something that he made very clear if you look at the entire back and forth. Yeah. Sean. Sean, Sean, two questions on the Philippines. Uh, first, is President Trump comfortable with the leaders' support of extrajudicial killings of drug users in the country? Obviously, there's a human rights component that goes into all of this. Um, and so it's a balance. We want to make sure that our country, our people are protected. Uh, this isn't a simple yes or no kind of situation. You've got a country in North Korea that possesses a nuclear weapon and is looking for the appropriate delivery system to potentially do harm. I think the President recognizes that the number one priority is the protection of our people, the safety of our people, and the safety of the people in the region. And so it's not just a question of either or. It's a question of priorities and balance. There's a lot that the President talks to these leaders in private about. And I think you saw that case in Egypt where sometimes that kind of diplomacy privately talking about them and building a relationship can achieve results uh, not just for our people but for their people um, and discussing how the human rights issues. But I think that th it would be a mistake to assume that the President, because we don't put out statements publicly chastising leaders at, at every call, uh, means that the President's not hold – hold on, let me answer the question. I think the President understands the value of it, but he understands the balance. And the reason that the President is building um, an effective coalition is getting results around the globe and reasserting America's place is because he understands the type of diplomacy and the type of negotiating and the type of deal making that actually gets real results for our country. So I, I think it's not a balancing it's a balancing act, but the president's getting real results. Cheryl. Tell me the second question if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, looking at there are three uh, open patents uh, with the Philippines government. One one from Trump trying to get Trump patented. Two from Ivanka Trump for her clothing line. Uh, how do you respond to concerns about potential conflicts of interest with uh, the leader of the Philippines? I think the President and Ivanka have done everything in compliance, um, made it very clear, and I would refer you to the Trump Organization. Cheryl. I just want to clarify something you said to Zeke. Is there a possibility that the President would not sign this spending agreement? This no, I mean, I, he's very pleased with, with the priorities, but I just want to let's wait till the, it's presented to him. But he is obviously very pleased uh, with how his priorities were addressed in the CR. And I have every expectation that, that he would sign it, but let's just uh, let's wait till it's on his desk. Are you still on track to uh, issue the uh, full fiscal year 18 budget? Is it mid May or do you have a date for that? Uh, I'll tell you about My understanding was it was still mid May, but I'd want to consult with uh, Director Mulvaney first. Jim. Uh, yeah, 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 thanks, Sean. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, first ask uh, what's your expectation and what's your hope for the meeting with uh, President of Boston Wednesday? And secondly, uh, is the President still considering moving the U.S. Embassy to Georgia, and will that be discussed? Uh, the, that is still being discussed by staff. Uh, and then what was this first question? I'm sorry. The first question is your expectations going forward. What, well, obviously, what do you hope from uh, the President's ultimate goal um, is to establish peace in the region. Um, and
and so I think he's going to, that's obviously the, the, the goal and the discussion that he's going to have with the head of the Palestinian Authority. Um, but there's, you know, that's, that's going to be a relationship that he continues to work on and build with the ultimate goal that, uh, that, that there's peace in that region between uh, Israel and, and the Palestinian Authority. Sean, Alexis. Sean, Sean. Can I follow up on infrastructure? The President has been talking about a, a major infrastructure package for more than a year in the campaign, but it doesn't seem very clear right now what the mechanism is for the construction of whatever it is that he wants to push forward. He talked about maybe attaching it to the reconciliation package for health care. He talked about maybe doing that with the tax package. Can you update us on, is that still very preliminary in its, uh, in its invention? Does he have clear ideas? And what's the mechanism and timing to get that done? I think he, he does. He's been working on that with his, with his uh, both economic and policy team. Um, but this week we're a little busy with the, uh, with the CR and health care. He laid out the tax package uh, last week, but it is clearly still up there on the priority list. Let's get through this week uh, and then hopefully have some additional details moving forward. But he has been very clear that that infrastructure package is something that he wants to get done and get moving. Um, this year, yeah, oh, absolutely. And it's just a question of uh, when he wants to, to announce it. But I think for this week, uh, we're pretty focused on getting the government funded for the last five months of 2017 and getting the um, and getting health care done as soon as we can. Um, so with that, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a great day. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, what about the film? I love it. It's about civil war. Why is that?